Welcome to What is sneaker mentory? They, they'll come together them. If anybody asks me to put anything in order like a top five, I can't. The, these two comers want these. I have bread, shadows, backboards, Chicago's, but this pair, like this, as soon as I seen this pair, I knew I had to have them. Sneakers, I could put them. So now it's become a culture, and this culture is part of me. Sneaker Mentor is about looking into the lives of sneaker collectors and gaining an understanding of their mentality to collecting. And why am I covering this? Because I'm a self-proclaimed sneaker collector. But firstly, why don't you follow me on a journey to where we met the collectors? We went to London. Coventry. Sheffield. New York. France. And best of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of it. But firstly, Let's go meet these collectors. Hi, my name's Christian. Um, I've been chosen to be part of Sneaker Entry. As a, I'm a collector, hoarder, stroke, addict. Cool. Hey, my name's Kish Cash. My name's Tyrone. Yeah, my name's Ray Brown. Um, I've been chosen to be part of the Sneaker Mention because I, I like sneakers. How did you get involved in the culture of collecting sneakers and partly reselling as well? I uh, have nothing to do with reselling. I will not resell. We'll get that we'll get that one out of the way first, I'm sorry, but uh, for me collecting it all it all stems back to hip hop. Um having that one item, that one thing that's that's fresh that no one else has ever had or no one else has got. So once you buy something and somebody else buys the same, you move on and you buy something different, it's to strive for that exclusivity to have that one thing that nobody else has got. Not to be a sheep basically. For me, getting involved in sneakers was just like uh, an evolution of my love of football and my love of hip hop. And both, both of them, you know, you had to wear trainers really. Then if you break dancing, you wear trainers, even though I was pretty shit at it. Uh, and then when you're playing football, which is not bad at, do you know what I mean you play football in the street or in the park? You know, you, you're having, you know, a kickabout with um, trainers on your feet. So it was all about that really the other day, and the whole look and the aesthetic and how all that sort of married up. And it just sort of went from there. Well, it's a real strange one. I suppose in some ways it's sort of born out of, when I was younger, I really wanted super cool trainers. It was just one of those things that you saw the people with them and you desired them. And my parents were like, no, you're not having them. I don't care what you say, you'll ruin them, you'll wreck them, you won't respect them. And you, might, you know how it was growing up, man. You had like one pair of kids, no, that's I mean, true. for everything. And I think it was kind of like the, the whole, I wanted what he had. So it was kind of like the grass is greener type thing. That's where it stemmed from for me. How long have you been doing this for? How long have you been collecting for? I've probably been collecting now for 20 years. But at 45, I think I got into trainers when I was about 12. So I was in school, I was in secondary school and I always had like the most kicks out of all of my friends. And back then I was like eight pets. But people would be like, oh shit, that's Ray was a guy with like mad kicks. And I thought I had mad kicks. Obviously, I, like, that's, this is like eight now, you know what I mean? So back then I had nothing really, but I always just wanted, the way I kind of see it is that like, I liked kicks the same as everyone else, but I just like acted on that urge more than everyone else. That was the thing to, to, to look good, you know what I mean? Um, and then that, w that went on through uh, the casual era, you know, having that one one pair that nobody else had got. Like when I went on holiday, we went out to France and stuff. All I wanted to do were go digging for trainers at, at 12, 13 years old. Well, I don't really collect. The thing is, I just buy stuff and I don't throw it away, so it's more like an archive. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's been a while. Yeah. It's been a long while since day, okay. should we say? Alors, je m'appelle Fabrice. Tout le monde m'appelle Bisso. Selecta Bisso, Bisso 9720. Euh, ben, je suis un sneaker addict qui vient de France, euh, plus précisément à Toulouse, dans le sud de la France. Hello, my name is Romelo Lopez. Um, I'm from the Bronx, and I was chosen to be part of Sneaker Mentory because I'm a sneaker collector. What's up, everyone? My name is John. I'm from Milan, living in London, and I've been chosen to be part of Sneaker Mentory because I'm a Nike lover. 
And how would you say your uh, passion for collecting has changed from when you um, first started to where it is now? I'm gonna say it's changed drastically because the culture is different. Like before, reselling, it was big, but it wasn't as big as it is now. I wasn't that informed about releases. I wasn't that informed about what, what this shoe was or what the other shoe. I would just walk into a shop and say, oh yeah, I like this shoe, I get it. Mais écoute, ça a été progressif. Donc comme je disais tout à l'heure dans les, les précédentes questions, j'ai commencé assez jeune, j'ai acheté, j'ai roqué, j'ai euh, roqué salement. Et au fil du temps, ben, j'ai accumulé pas mal de paires. Du coup, ça a été une collection, j'ai fait tourner les paires et j'ai pris de plus en plus soin de, de mes chaussures. Après, au niveau de mes, ben, au niveau de mes goûts, j'ai été vers Azix, Adidas, Nike. Et, euh, et plus ça a été, plus, plus ma passion a, a grandi et plus j'ai essayé de trouver des choses un peu plus pointues, des, des modèles inédits, des... Voilà. It's a lot harder to get shoes. So unless you really know somebody, you gotta really go out your way to get sneakers. I know everything that is gonna happen in the next six months. Um, I spend my days looking into new and old releases, just saying, okay, uh, there is this shoe that came out last year that I couldn't get. I want it, so I will just make sure in some, somehow I will get it. I'm not your average trainer collector that's sort of like, Today, uh, I don't do hype at all, and I can't stress this enough. I, I draw the, oh, you know, people go out and buy some off-whites or some Yeezys or whatever, four, five hundred pounds. I draw the spend that four, hundred, four, five hundred pounds and six months hunting to get a couple of pairs that nobody else has got that have been put away in a storeroom and forgot. You know, these things just crop up every now and again. Let's take a quick history lesson. In the late 1970s to 80s, hip-hop and football had a huge influence on the sneaker collecting culture. For example, with hip-hop, individuals wanted to set themselves apart from the crowd just as their favourite artists did in their music videos. This could have meant by wearing the same pair of sneakers but in just different colourways. Puma suede, Puma suede, shell toes. Suede and shell toes are sort of a staple for me. Yeah. I grew up. You know, it's the 80s we're popping, breaking and stuff like that. So, um, you know, that were, were a thing back then. I must have got 20 or 30 pairs of each, different colours. And then with football, individuals couldn't be seen wearing the same clothes or sneakers when they were playing football with their friends. So this influenced individuals to buying the same trainers, but in different colourways as well. And this was the beginning of the sneaker collector. But let's give it back to the collectors to tell us more. My name is Ryan St. John. I'm from uh, Hempstead, New York, and I got chosen to be part of Sneaker Mentry because I'm a sneaker collector. Hi, I'm Callum from Sheffield, and I've been chosen to be part of the Sneaker Mentory because I'm a collector and I run my own YouTube channel called The Sneaker Room. Yeah, the main kind of question is, why do you do it? Why do you collect? <laughs> um, a couple of reasons, I suppose. Um, one, addiction. Um, I don't care what anyone says that when when you get past, you know, probably ten or twenty pairs of trainers, then it becomes an addiction. The main focus for me is like having something on your feet that stands out. And I mean, I got involved in all the community as well, and the community was like great. I was looking deep into like Tinker Hatfield um, and a lot of few other Nike designers, and just the aesthetics, like I said, of the shoe, how they're made, um, where the uh, the design concept came from a lot of that background of the shoe is what interests me, and that's what you know. Hey, I mean, I just like the aesthetics of everything at the end of the day, you know, it's the whole look of the outfit, um, I've always done some current styles or whatever, classic styles as well. Um, I think it's important to, you know, just have, you know, appreciation of things that really make life colorful and really give it form and also mark you out as an individual as well. Bah écoute, je collectionne euh, parce que c'est avant tout une passion. Euh, la sneaker, c'est partie de moi euh, maintenant, en fait. Hein. Euh, dès que je m'habille, eh ben, je vois tout de suite quelle paire de sneakers je pourrais mettre. Donc euh, maintenant, c'est devenu carrément une culture et cette culture, elle fait partie de moi. The global retail market for sneakers is worth just over 55 billion dollars and is estimated to be worth 95 billion dollars by 2025.
The reselling market for sneakers is worth just over a billion dollars and the opportunity to make high profits has increased violence to the culture of collecting and purchasing rare sneakers. Violence surrounding the culture has forced some retailers to shut down sneak releases to ensure the safety of customers. In an attempt to reduce violence, some retailers and brands have implemented online raffles and competitions where individuals can only turn up to the store if they have won. Although the model has seen a reduction in violence, there has been a rise in online hackers hijacking competitions to ensure that they win. The next stage is for brands to increase the production of rare sneakers, ensuring that all customers have the ability and opportunity to acquire a pair of sneakers they are after. However, this reduces the value and meaning of a rare sneaker. Do you think it's fair that resellers are able to create higher profit margins than what the brands retail the sneakers at? It's part of the game, really. There's two sides to it. I mean, like, I appreciate everybody's hustle and what they do. And I mean, it's whatever anybody's going to do to make money. It kind of messed up the culture, but it doesn't, it never really bothered me. If you feel like that's how you got to make a living, then hey, for me, I just got to, I got to get the shoes quicker than you. I think it's fair. I definitely think it's fair because if, if people weren't paying the money, they wouldn't be making the money. I mean, you gotta pay the price at the end of the day. I do think it is slightly unfair, like, um, just because, you know, your intent isn't to have those shoes, it's just to make profit off of them in a sense. But the people that may really want them, um, they're only, they only there for one pair. And then you got the people who are reselling with bots or got multiple people in line for them, they're getting one of the one pairs you possibly could have gotten. Some people, you know, that's why they go home with no shoes and things like that. So I do see that as slightly unfair. Sometimes it's fair, sometimes it ain't, but that's life. I don't even know how it's legal, bro. Like, honestly, I study economics, yeah? Reselling is illegal, like, like real talk. That you don't pay taxes on, on, on what, you, what you make. It's a black market, you know what I mean? When it comes to talking about resellers, sneaker collectors have divided opinions on the matter. Some sneaker collectors find resellers to be beneficial. On the other hand, some sneaker collectors find what resellers are doing to be morally wrong and illegal. My name's Theo, I'm from Bradford. I've been chosen to be a part of Sneaker Mentory because I'm a reseller. Hi, uh, my name is Cern. I've been doing uh, buying and selling sneakers since 2000 and uh, probably 2012. How did you get involved in the culture of sneaker collecting and reselling? So when I left college about a year and a half ago, I uh, was actually looking for a job. And I've been doing so, so I was searching for something to sell to work for myself because I wasn't finding the job that I wanted to do. So I thought, well, I'll combine a passion with a passion with a business. So I'll enjoy doing what I'm doing, and it's just sort of grown from there. I've always been collecting sneakers since I was a kid. It's just part of my uh, part of my interest, part of my hobby. And uh, I really started selling them because I was I was in uni and I I didn't have a part time job, so I thought. <laughs> I need to make some money so I can go on holiday and maybe buy some more sneakers. And so I, I did some research, but uh, then I you know, found out this event called Crab City, and I, just, I emailed them, asked ask them about it, see if I can have a table. With the power that you've got to your left here, um, this was a shoe where some stores uh, actually made people wear them and kind of crease the nylon on them. So, what are your views on kind of how some retailers are? against resellers and force people to wear shoes so that they can't resell them as dead stock. I definitely understand it. I understand the stigma before towards resellers. But I mean, without resellers, where, where would you buy these shoes? You can't buy them. It's only people like me you can buy them. None of these shoes are in stock anymore. Stores like Offspring are one of those stores that have decided that they don't want people who don't want to keep the shoe getting hold of the shoe. 
it's not 100% foolproof in some of the methods they do. A lot of people don't like it. So what does it mean to you to be a reseller? It puts you in a scene where everybody has similar interests. So it's just like people have been interested in football, talking to other football fans, or interested in boxing or whatever, whatever. So it's just it's just a community where everyone's got the similar similar interests, and you know we're just learning with people from who have maybe been in it 20 years or just been in it last week. It's the way you to express yourself, express your identity, and uh, makes you stand out from the rest of the rest of the kids. Although resellers are seen in a negative light by retailers and majority of sneaker collectors, the resellers I interviewed were genuinely attempting to provide a service for sneaker collectors and other sneak fanatics to be able to purchase sneakers that they missed out on. My personal opinion on sneaker resellers, I'm on the fence. I understand what they're doing and why they do it, but then also I see how it does affect the culture of sneaker collecting. But nonetheless, I think it's time we got to see the collection of the collectors. Bon, alors question très difficile quand même. Et, euh, il va falloir que je réfléchisse rapidement. Ce, ce ne sera pas dans l'ordre, mais ce qui me vient à l'esprit là comme ça, euh, je dirais la Gelite 5 Volcano. Pourquoi Parce que ça a été mon, mon premier camp à Toulouse, dans ma ville, et qu'il a fallu camper deux jours pour avoir cette paire. That's number one. Always will be number one in my eyes. It's the Air Max One Elephant and it's the 2017 release for the Air Max State was a vote forward campaign and these took me so long to get and this is the, this is what started the love for it. I mean like just the elephant prints incredible. They're my favourite pair. If I was ever gonna get a pair. Again I, if I could double up, I'll, I'll double up on these. To the Air Jordan 6. The Jordan 6 is like my favourite silhouette. And then the and then the uh, the eleven. But these are like pretty much, pretty much fresh, man. Like I've worn these a couple of times. I think I literally worn these like on my birthday, two, three years ago. And then I wore them to like a, a pajama party or some dish like that, man. You know what I'm saying? So indoors, the leather's perfect on them. You know what I mean? The new box perfect. These uh, have always been a staple in my collection. I've got loads of pairs of each. Fat laces in them. These. I'll rock all day, every day. I absolutely love these. They're such, such iconic silhouettes. I mean, these were the first trainers that ever came out, you know what I mean? Low technology, not very much comfort to be fair. Rubbish for running in, but they look exactly how I I like them to, you know what I mean? The, the whole B-boy type thing. They, they're, they'll come together then. If anybody asks me to put anything in order like a top five, I can't, the, these two come as one, these. To me, they're, they're both the same, you know, style and stuff like that. Ensuite, très rapidement, euh, je dirais la Diadora V7000 A Few The Cure, 50 paires monde, euh, qui était uniquement distribué en, au Japon. Euh, un concours avait été mis en place par A Few pour gagner deux ou trois paires. J'ai gagné ce concours grâce à mon fils avec euh, qui j'ai fait une vidéo. La, la vidéo a plu, j'ai gagné, donc euh, voilà. C'était pour moi exceptionnel d'avoir fait quelque chose avec mon fils et, et de pouvoir emporter, euh, emporter cette paire. This shoe is probably like my favorite out of all my ones. I have bread, shadows, backboards, Chicago, but this pair, like this, as soon as I seen this pair, I knew I had to have it. And I basically wore this pair through the entire time that my son was being born in hospital. So I don't think I'll ever sell these. I think that I always, I've got pictures of me holding them as a newborn with these on my feet. So the likelihood is that as long as I don't wear them too much and ruin them, then the likelihood is I'll probably just hold on to them as long as I can. Like these are the KD6s. So it's a mashup of every KD6 to drop. Um, just the whole mashup of designs, I think is what really made me want these. And for the mere fact that I, I was itching for a what the pair, but I would always miss them. And then the resale on them is stupid. Never worn these. I probably never will. They're too big for me. And like, I just think that they look dope as they are. Air Max ones have always been a, a massive sort of part in my collection. Loads of pairs, the anniversaries and stuff like I absolutely love. These are hemp ones. These very rare to get a pair that haven't cracked around here. These are in, you know, decent, obviously missed it on bubble, but that comes with age. But for me, this, the shape, the whole Max One shape and stuff like that, the silhouette of these, 
absolutely stunning, probably one of the best fair trainers that's ever been released. Uh, at the time they came out, there were no such thing as hype. I just wanted vibrant shoe, a shoe that can correspond with my brand in a sense. My brand colors are green, red, and yellow. Uh, green, red, and yellow is in the shoe, so um, yeah, I have yet these have yet to touch earth, so well, I don't know when I'm gonna back them out, but soon. The moon landings, they're some of my favorite pair. I mean, they took me ages to get as well, and I mean. It was Vince Graham that sold me that sold me these for 320. He really didn't want to. But <laughs> he, he needed money and that's what we do. We have to sell pairs that we don't want to sell. And they were grail status for a long time, like a real long time. Ensuite la charbette. Euh, c'est une paire que je cherchais depuis presque deux ans. Les prix c'était environ 1000 euros. J'ai réussi à trouver un trait plutôt sympa euh, contre une easy. Donc euh, hyper satisfait, j'ai eu le pack complet. And my favorite shoe of all time, uh, are Jordan 1. I don't, I don't care about the colorway. Uh, yeah, there is some that I might not like, but this is my opinion, the best shoe ever made. I could go through every single pair that I've got and, and tell you like, how much they mean to me. Alongside the rise in sneaker collecting and reselling, the culture has fallen victim to the counterfeit market which many resellers and collectors have varied opinions on. I think counterfeits are just as bad in sneakers as any other counterfeit culture that's out there. And if you don't know what you're putting your money into, whether you care or not, the likelihood is it's probably not going to be for good things. The fake market, morally, obviously that's someone's work in it. But as a consumer, I would probably cut some fakes if they looked good enough. Unless you're going to stop somebody walking through a shopping mall and go, take them off, let me have a look inside insult, they're fake. Uh, a lad at 17 or 18 who couldn't afford four fifty, six hundred pound resell on him can have his flex. Uh, and that's, that's completely up to him. But for me, it's not. But I don't see that side of it. It's not so much of a concern within shops because the brands control that. You know, they're very active in making sure that the, that the stores are not carrying counterfeit product. But it's on the resale market that there's the, there's the issue. Hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. It's, rid it's ridiculous how much counterfeit stuff's going about because of the internet. That, that's, that's probably the worst thing about it. But if, you, you know, if you're buying from trust, trustworthy sources, then that, that's just the safest way to do it. I knew of a guy who was claiming to have early release pairs of a certain shoe splashing it all over community groups on Facebook and on Reddit and then brought his shoes to a sneaker con and was found to be fake. As the culture of collecting and reselling has been growing, counterfeit sneakers are creating a huge market. The rise in counterfeit sneakers is driving brands to produce high quantities of rare sneakers to reduce the loss of revenue filtering into the counterfeit market. The approach from the brands is receiving a mixed reception as it decreases the value of rare sneakers but inevitably challenges the resale and counterfeit market. Since the late 1970s the sneaker market and collecting culture has seen big changes and a substantial rise in customers and collectors. With how the culture of collecting has changed from when you started to where it's now. Uh, would, do you have any kind of visions of how it could possibly look like in the future? Mm. Whether, whether that be it's going to carry on on the rise or it's eventually going to come to a fall off point? I think it's going to come to a fall off point. Something new will come along. It really will. As a fad, everything does. You'll be left with the the hardcore few that'll do it, and then there'll be the others that either grow up and get families and can't afford to do it, or, you know, uh, just learn to drive and get cars. And, and, just, and the, the money will be taken elsewhere, they'll get mortgages and stuff like that. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think it can only go up. I think it's really good time with the internet in the, in the minute. I think a lot of people are getting involved that really are not that into change, but they still, they still love watching watching it all on say Instagram or Facebook. So I think it can just grow, 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 grow and get bigger. I feel like it's gonna die down eventually. Mais écoute, j'en reviens à la, à la culture. Maintenant c'est une culture, donc euh, pour moi ça ne peut qu'évoluer, ça ne peut que grandir. 
peut-être stagner, mais ça repartira à chaque fois, puisque ça fait vraiment partie euh, ben, d'une culture complète, quoi, la culture sneakers. Although the market for sneakers is predicted to continue rising, the future of collecting remains uncertain. There are divided opinions amongst collectors over this issue, as some strongly believe the culture will continue growing, while others argue it's on an imminent decline. journey we've been on. We've got to meet some amazing sneak collectors from all over the world and got an insight into the life of a sneak collector. However, throughout the process of creating this documentary, I contacted numerous female collectors but none were willing to get involved due to availabilities and simply not wanting to be identified on camera. But maybe this leaves room for a sneakumentary volume 2 based around the lives of female sneak collectors. Who knows? I'm Tadiwa Katsande and you've been watching Life's too short to sit around and do nothing. Gotta get up and make it happen. But I'm saying this from experience. I'm pulling my way up. But I ain't gonna stop till I get there. Had my ups and had my downs. But I ain't gonna let it defeat me. Look, ever since this start, this start everybody's been on me. Yeah? Like, why do you rap? You're never gonna step foot in the charts So don't put me on a mission But I'm never gonna quit till I'm up Look, now I've got fans, I've got fans. And now I'm getting money So you better know I'm feeding myself Cause I'm working my ass off They didn't really wanna see me when I came up as a kid in the scene But now I'm getting views and yeah, I'm getting